Thank you for coming and uh, uh, taking a little time today to, to, uh, to participate in this discussion. Um, I'm really pleased that we're here in, in room 130. I, um, I, uh, this is a, I haven't been in here since uh, this room was redone, not this last summer, but the summer before. Uh, but I used to teach uh, abnormal psychology in this room. Uh, it didn't look anything like this. It was uh, a, a lot less uh, conducive. So it's really cool now to be here you know, in a contemporary classroom, what Mike can I'm sure test, which was not so contemporary just a couple of uh, years ago. The other thing I think is great about this room, and I only just discovered, uh, if I go back to the psych department and teach, I'm going to re request this room because these are perfect. These are the perfect size for me. I don't know who designed that, but um, I, that's, that's great. I had, uh, you know, more typically when I talk to students, it's like this, and, I, and so I like that. <clears throat> anyway, so today's, you know, we have these discussions <clears throat> a couple times a semester, these uh, academic affairs faculty forums, and uh, you know, the purpose is to um, you know, have some dialogue with the broader uh, you know, academic affairs community you know, about a variety of issues. And we, you know, this is, we had, is in this forum, we started to talk about the signature programs. We, we, we unveiled how we were going to reorganize um, or some ideas about reorganizing uh, the graduate school and the Office of Vice President for Research. So there are opportunities for us to, um, you know, to sort of update the campus as best we can on some things that are going on. And, uh, and then they get input um, uh, from folks. Today's is, is the same, this is the same kind of, uh, kind of thing. Um, we want to update on some of what's been going on around uh, classroom renovation uh, and IT uh, renovation. We also, though, I think, uh, at, least, at least as importantly, not just talk about you know, some of the cool things that I'll show you that's, that's been accomplished, but talk a little bit about the processes that we've put into place to try our very best to stay on top of this in some kind of rational way. Um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm starting, I say, I finished three years in, in this job as provost, and, uh, you know, and I've worked here, as everyone knows, for a long time, and, um, you know, each new thing I get involved with, or each thing I get involved with, when we start, you know, it, I, I, always, I always think I know the answer, and it's always pretty simple, right? And then when I get into it, it's really complex, and uh, what I thought was the answer is not, is stupid, right? So, this is no exception to that. You know, and I've been here long enough, and I would complain, why, why, why does my classroom not have look cool? And they got better classrooms over there, and it must be because they like them better, or the university doesn't value this or that. And um, so we have done some things as a team to try to bring some rationality uh, to it, and, and, and also to try to do it in a, um, what's the term, that transparent way. Um, you know, you can say how well we've succeeded on that, but this is part of that effort. To at least say, at least conceptually, this is how we think we're trying to stay on top of it, um, you know, and how are we doing, and, and are there other ways that we, we could do that. So for today, um, they're kind of, I don't know, you might organize this maybe into three, three pieces. One is a little bit of a kind of show and tell. I'm going to show you a little bit about some of the uh, renovation work, um, updating innovation work that we've done in classrooms, primarily uh, some work done just this past summer. Um, and then talk a little bit about this, what, what we think we've set up in terms of processes to try our best to stay on top of this. And then finish with a little bit about um, opportunities uh, moving forward. Um, and there are some, uh, some opportunities for us to, uh, uh, you know, well, not to solve all our problems around classroom, but to make some significant strides. Now, I, I want to point out that I've got people here to, um, who really are much more uh, in this work than I, than I am and uh, will likely turn things and ask for their help or invite them or at least um, not allow them to hide during this presentation. So I've got Jeff St. John, who you'll see uh, is, a, is integral in, in my office's um, uh, participation in this process. We have Stuart Harvey from Facilities, and we have Robin Sherman, uh, our, our IT um, person here at the University of Maine. So they've been very involved in this. They will be going forward. I'll ask them to jump in at any point. I think I've got something wrong or um, you want, I need help in answering questions. Okay, so in this last year, this last summer, we've put a, a, a fair amount of uh, work into uh, renovating, uh, into renovating uh, classes. And I want to show you a little bit about that. And then I, wanna do, I do want to give you a little bit of a big picture you know, what's the landscape here at the University of Maine? What are we trying to get our, 
our, our hands around. So I'm going to show you some before and after pictures. Uh, uh, this is kind of what did uh, facilities do on their summer vacation. Um, and so this is room uh, upstairs here in the little hall, kind of your, your basic classroom. Um, uh, and again, I won't wax too nostalgic, but I think I taught in there, and I actually think I took a graduate seminar in there, and I think those are the exact same chairs I sat in uh, when we did it. It's been re renovated over the summer. This is what the more contemporary uh, uh, classroom looks like. Uh, next we have 218, another seminar room, I guess you'd call it, um, with mismatching tables. Uh, and um, so that's been redone, uh, introducing new technologies. And I don't know, uh, Stuart or Robin, are there anything, anything about the technologies that are in those classrooms now? Worth, worth noting? Uh, I think it's, it's just a matter of trying to, to uh, come up to date with what's going on. We all know that technology changes so quickly nowadays that we're try, just trying to keep up with the changing technology. I know IT and the group has been working on trying to um, make a more consistent package of technology as we're going forward. It makes it easier for us in facilities to, to implement projects in a timely fashion. Yeah. So. But with that perspective, they maybe have a better sense of what's in a classroom when they, you know, what they can expect in an updated classroom or basic technologies that are there. Okay. Uh, let's see. Over in uh, North Stevens, again, another pretty traditional looking setup, and that's been uh, completely redone uh, for more contemporary and more, we hope, we hope more functional space. Is there another one? Oh, yeah, another one in Stevens Hall, 121 Stevens. Uh, one thing that you'll notice consistent here is the change from tablet on chairs to, yeah. to actual desks and with the change in how students are, are uh, taking notes using computers and those sorts of things. It does have a, an impact on the, uh, the amount of, of uh, students that we can put into a room. Yeah. You'll see some of this one, for example, you'll see that the, the, the front row is is up pretty close to the front of the yeah. room to try and keep the number of students yeah. in the classroom up. Yeah. I was complimenting you or complimenting this room, but I suspect this has a few less seats than it did when I taught it. Yeah, so there is this kind of give and take, if you will, it uh, around that. Yeah. Just one of the variables that you were trying to manage. Another one, and this was in Center Stevens uh, classroom, now more contemporary kind of conference for small comp or conference room for small seminar, et cetera, uh, type of classroom with the newer technology, uh, technologies available. All right. So this is kind of a little bit of the landscape, right? So there are 111 classrooms that are uh, controlled, if you will, by uh, student records, right? So those are the ones that get assigned, uh, for these are, you know, uh, for obviously for teaching. But well, then there's another 148 classrooms uh, that are used exclusively by maybe one or a small number of departments and aren't controlled uh, uh, by the, the central student records. Um, so that's one of the challenges. Um, and again, I, I'll talk later a little bit about moving forward. That's been one of the little bit of wrinkles that we've had to kind of work through. What else makes this work? There are a variety of things that make this work, um, you know, interesting, challenging. Uh, some of it is, as, as uh, Stuart already alluded to, that you know the technologies are constantly changing. So there's always a, it's always a game to, to to stay up or as close to up as we as we can. But uh, there are different tools. There are different um, you know different uh, pedagogies that our faculty need to want to need to use. Um, there's obviously variations in classroom uh, sizes. Um, there's variations in um, uh, you know, what technologies, what faculty members uh, want or use. Uh, that all make this um, you know, a, bit of a, a bit of a trick. Facilities needs to work with um, IT, right? The university could end up, and probably historically, Someone could give me examples of what we have <laughs> worked, uh, done it in the wrong order. So we did a lot of great, cool work and then said, oh, the IT will not possibly work in that. 
time to undo it or do it. So there is that, that's one of the, um, one of the things that's a, a, a challenge. There's the um, staying on top of things uh, throughout the year, right? There's the plan schedule, uh, but then there's the things that break, fall apart, get water damage, um, um, uh, et cetera. Most of the big projects, for obvious reasons, get planned in the summer and then to somewhat of a lesser extent during the winter break. Um, and again, that presents its, uh, its uh, scheduling challenges. And, and I won't give examples, but I know for sure there are times that facilities has a nice plan for summer uh, and someone like me or someone <laughs> Uh, over in Lemon Isle says, I'm sorry, but this is now our top priority. Uh, we have to get this done for X, Y, Z reason. Facilities then has to re-examine. Um, so it's a, it, there's a lot of uh, you know, tricks and challenges to doing this you know, it, efficiently in terms of time, but resource management. As everyone knows here, we have uh, you know, X minus amount of resources and we have whatever it is, 2x or something larger than x in needs. And so we're, you know, in, in this, this area as well as most, we're constantly sort of looking to say, are we using this in the best way? Are we sequencing the work? Are we, um, are we um, you know, taking advantage of our, of our resources in the best way? All right, so now we shift a little bit in terms of what, how we, we're trying. Um, to, to do this uh, rationally. About three years ago, again, uh, Jeff St. John and I were relatively new to our jobs. We were working with facilities, having conversations, having conversations with the deans group and with faculty groups, hearing about challenges and concerns. You know, what you learn in administration 101, form a committee, right? So we did look at that as part of uh, the solution. And this particular committee, the Space Management uh, Committee, is pretty large, but I do want to flash up the membership because I wanted to see that we are trying to reach out broadly, right? There are folks we need who have to be part of this conversation from facilities. There are folks we need from um, IT. We want to make sure there's faculty voice here. So we have faculty representatives. We primarily have worked with uh, the Faculty Senate uh, to get representatives from the faculty uh, into, these, uh, into these discussions. Uh, there's representation uh, from my office. Um, there's folks around in you know, safety and environment in this. This group is kind of their job, and again, I'll ask Jeff to jump in if I this right. Their, their job is to take the big picture view, to be bringing in data, uh, information, and that's why we're so inclusive uh, in the committee is to gather you know, the information about the whole you know, breadth of the, the, uh, the campus. To make some sense of that and just at least start the conversations around, okay, how are we gonna prioritize? How are we gonna move forward uh, to address as many needs as we possibly can within the resource constraints that we have and the timetables that we have to work in? But I'm sure you've all been on committees and stuff, right? so this is a big group to really get things done. Right? So we realized, okay, that, this is important for one part of what we're trying to accomplish, which is bring the campus community into the conversation, um, access the information that we need um, so that we at least have a good starting point. But it's not really the right size and makeup to say, let's build a schedule for summer of 2017. What are we gonna do? in May, June, July, how long this will take and how much will it cost and what's the estimates to get down to the work. So then we have the smaller, leaner, meaner paint and polish committee. Well, this group is charged with really executing, moving things forward. They start meeting in October and meet monthly right through April. And you know, a big chunk of what they're doing is planning the summer's projects, right? Now, I think they're also doing some other things around, uh oh, we got a problem here we have to solve now. Um, uh, uh, you know, um, things that have come up, et cetera. But a lot of it is taking, and again, communicating, you'll see some overlap in membership between this and the larger committee. We say, okay, here's the big data, here's the data we've gotten, here's what we've heard. Now, let's get down to the, the, the figuring out uh, of how we're going to address this. 
Uh, that's you, Jeff. You're, you're on, well, what, what would you add to my descriptions of these two? I would only add that, that we got Peter Schilling's title wrong. He has not replaced Monique in her job. <laughs> <laughs> so Peter is the Executive Director of uh, Innovation in Teaching and Learning on campus, and Monique is the Associate Provost for DLL. So there has not been a coup. <laughs> Monique will be the So I'd say, Monique, I talked to you for a few minutes after this meeting. Thank you, Jim. Yes. The only thing I would add is that, is that Stuart and his team uses uh, me, Sarah Henry, Peter, Berta Hussey to offer the non-facilities perspectives on priorities. And then we rely heavily on Stuart and his team and Robin and her team to then build out the FM and IT uh, workflow priorities, how we're going to punch out the projects. Is that a fair? It is. And I think the other dynamic to this, which is probably the most important one, is we search for funding sources. Yeah. And a lot of those funding sources, like this group that we use for the summer, have some specific uh, parameters to them. For example, some of the money we spent this summer was left over from the STEM bond. So it could only be used for this sort of set group of purposes. And then we have other funding sources, and we're always out trying to find funding sources um, that we could use for other things. So we're trying to prioritize the work with the funding source, with the priorities and the emerging issues. And it's really a, a dynamic group. And I, I mean, we're going to see some examples of what was accomplished this summer from that. And, and again, you know, taking the, trying to take the institutional priorities that we're hearing from the committee, the management committee, to drive the decision. <coughs> Yeah, thank you. Because that, yeah, that, that is an important piece of this. Is that um, this committee is opportunistic, right? It's looking for how do we leverage this source against this this source. How do we make sure we're you know bringing to the table uh, you know as much as we can to try to address these. And the bond issue is a good example. You know, because work was done you know efficiently, below, you know below budget. Um, there then was bond money that came forward. Now, two years before that, we couldn't have counted on that money being there, right? We didn't know that, but that changed the picture and allowed for us to look at things in a different way. And I think, again, Jeff summarized it well, too. It's the academics, instead of saying, hey, we want this, and silly folks are saying, well, okay, here's a dose of reality, wake up, you know. Um, but, but also bringing in, saying, okay, here, here's what we can do, right? And oh, by the way, here's some additional sources that we found. <clears throat> you know, one of the issues that, um, you know, can seem a puzzle is how did you prioritize that? How did, uh, uh, you know, Little Hall 130 get on the list? Why didn't my place get on the list? And, you know, to be frank, typically there's not a short answer to that, right? It, it is, okay, what are the institution's needs? What are the usage patterns? But it's also, what money can we bring to the table on this? Uh, the bond money always has some restrictions on it. There are things we just cannot do with bond money. We would be, you know, breaking the law. Um, uh, if we did, if we did that, there are monies that deans will bring in and say, "Look, this is a priority for for my operation," and that changes the, or it's, it's a factor in the discussion, right? Okay, if we can leverage some of this money with the central money, well, then we get we the whole campus gets a bigger bang for the buck. So it is often hard to say, "Well, here's exactly here's our here's our list of classrooms, and we have 111 there, the 148. You're number 27 on the list, and." You know, it's a it's a fluid um, a fluid operation, and I think that's a good thing. I don't say that apologetically. That's a good thing because again, it's the way that we try to maximize our use of, of resources. So, how's it supposed to work, right? So there's a problem, concern, uh, issue, request. Um, you know, can come. These are the the typical sources. The typical, although not exclusive. Uh, pathway is uh, from a faculty to their chair to their dean up to this um, up to this committee but that doesn't exclude if, if a faculty member who's on that broader committee I showed you brings up an issue the committee doesn't say take it back to your chair and it has to work up the chain of command we just know that our communication systems are just not that perfect right <laughs> um, it's not it's maybe this is a good or bad example it's not the military it, you know we are more flexible, but that is the idea. Now again, if a faculty member brings something in and gets this committee, it's gaining some traction, we're certainly gonna bring the dean into the conversation 
and the chair, uh, in many cases, into the conversation uh, before decisions are made. But we want the information, we want to try to create as many avenues as we can, if you will, for information to come in. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, I just back up. Yes. That. I mean, facilities is also um, sort of in parallel with this process, out talking to the, to the colleges on a fairly regular Thank basis, you. meeting with them about, about all of that. And, and I would say that we have requests coming into facilities you know, every week. Yeah. Um, a lot of those we just take and either do or work with the colleges to get done. Um, the ones that we think need to go back or up through or into yeah. the process, we send now over to the space committee and up and, and down through Payton College. But I mean, we do lots and lots of yeah. other things that smaller, maybe not necessarily classroom related, more more research laboratory or, or office and 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 uh, other things. So, which we just can't. Yeah. Then all people who have the impression is everything's gotta go to this large uh large we'll, we'll help funnel space management. Those things. Yeah. That that rise to that level. Thank you. Okay. As I said, they look at the, the gather information. They only meet once each semester, right? So they gather the information, reviewing things, look at the resources that are available, uh, collecting and sharing the updates. And then it goes on to the paint and polish uh, committee um, you know, to develop and then let's develop what is our plan uh, as we move forward. Okay. And again, these are the kind of guiding principles that, uh, uh, that the committee's, uh, or the goals, if you will, the committees have. The fact that they have the, the students have the resources that they need. Are we, are we getting at the highest priority? Uh, are we achieving the greatest return on investment? Again, sometimes these um, line up perfectly and sometimes they don't, right? You get a bigger return on investment doing this and maybe it wasn't the highest priority, but because we're gonna get such a big return, we're gonna move it up. And that's just the, re the reality of how we, you know, you're gonna, we've gotta make decisions. But those are the, you know, the guiding goals uh, in their decision making. Okay, so let's go, again go back to uh, uh, this, this, this last summer. There have been some exciting things. Um, we have another, I think the phrase is smart classroom, um, in now in Scheibel's Hall. So we've had the classroom in Estabrook Hall. Um, uh, what's the number of that, 130? 130, 130 Estabrook Hall. Uh, there are about 20 faculty who used it pretty regularly. Um, what uh, Peter Schilling did was meet with those faculty, uh, get input from them uh, about what, you know, what was good, what they liked, what was working. Um, and then Peter uh, helped us working with facilities and, and Jeff's group to think through how do we then create additional more smart classrooms. So we've created a new one here in, um, in Scheibel's Hall. You can see a couple of before pictures and the nice uh, neat uh, after pictures. I assume each of these are uh, screens for uh, technology to, to flash up, et cetera. Any other features that you, anyone want to point out about these rooms, Peter, or anything? That was sure. So there, there's a screen for each table so that the students can work uh, at each table and have a screen to themselves, and then the faculty can control all of the screens uh, from the center. Another before and after is work we've done in Winslow Hall this past uh, this past summer. Again, taking some really space that was in really rough shape uh, and uh, turning into to usable space. I think again, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was 16 classrooms that went through major renovations this summer. One was at the Darling Marine Center, uh, and 15 were on the campus here that went over went uh, underwent these sort of large scale. Uh, turnover renovations. Okay. So this is a, the, the kind of typical timeline. Um, as I already said, the Paint and Polish Committee, they meet uh, from October through April. Uh, they uh, finalize the plan in the spring. Uh, they get their, their teams, Stuart and uh, now Robin with IT, uh, and a big piece is, uh, is this piece, is getting then the plan that IT and facilities have a coordinated approach uh, to uh, working and updating uh, uh, the classrooms. And the philosophy has been to think about these things together. Um, we're not, or we, we're, 
we'd prefer not to put you know, the latest, greatest technology in a class that has falling ceiling tiles and, and paint falling off the, uh, the wall. So we're trying to do this in concert so that, um, so that you know, when we've redone a classroom, we feel like, okay, that classroom uh, is done. And we're not doing it, uh, you know, a bit over here and a bit over there. Um, yeah, and then the big time is uh, in the summers, of course. And everybody wants their project done in the summer. Uh, and it's uh, always a challenge. Uh, um, uh, to do it, but Stuart and his team, somewhere in the back row there, do fantastic work at uh, staying on top, sometimes ahead, getting a little more done in the summer than they, in, than they anticipate, um, but always realistic in getting feedback about, to us about what can and can't, can't be done. So, I talked already a little bit about communication. Um, you know, again, uh, we're a relatively uh, big place, although compared to many universities, we're, we're not that big, but we're a pretty big operation. You know, what we're trying to do, this, this talk today is only a small piece of it, um, is to have, you know, uh, a free and uh, open exchange of information about what the heck is going on and what the heck are we doing about it. So uh, one key place is the role with the associate deans, um, Jeff St. John, you know, meets with that group every month. Part, you know, they bring ideas, concerns, issues to the table. Stuart and Robin uh, are updating, as you already heard from uh, Stuart. They're receiving, you know, requests maybe daily or very regularly. <laughs> um, and, uh, and managing as many of those as they can on the spot uh, immediately, determining which ones are larger and need to come up uh, uh, through there. Um, we talk, uh, we bring it to the Dean's group about uh, larger projects um, to bring people on board. I know to use as an example when we had the STEM bond from 2013, I think is when the money came available. Um, you know, that was limited by the way the bond was written. We had to make sure that it, uh, the majority of the education in those classrooms were in STEM disciplines. Um, but that's a pretty broad uh, area. We, of course, had many more areas than we, we could have. We came forward with a list, we modified the list. I think you probably remember one dean in particular felt very strongly about how we had, uh, what we had put on and not put on there. It was fine. It was a good conversation and we could understand um, and, and revisited the way those classes were, were prioritized. Um, we are trying to make folks available. I mean, uh, we, you know, I, I know most people try to check the Provost website once a week or so just to see what's happening. Um, <laughs> But uh, if you are curious, uh, it is posted on uh, our website. Here's what we've done. Uh, here's what's on, uh, you know, the things that have been accomplished to get a sense of what's going on. We are trying to work closely with the faculty. You already saw uh, we have faculty representatives on the Space Management Committee uh, and the Patent Polish uh, Committee. Um, we have the, the uh, what is it they call their um, university environment. We have the co-chairs from the Faculty Senate serve on the smaller uh, patent, uh, patent Polish Committee as well as the uh, larger committee. So again, we're trying in a variety of ways uh, to um, you know, have this be a dialogue uh, and not uh, uh, just Stuart and his team saying, here's what we're doing now, get out of the way, uh, here's this. It's more uh, it's a, you know, information going uh, back and forth. I want to talk a little bit about uh, opportunities moving forward. So the University of Maine system has uh, funds uh, now available called cla for Classrooms for the Future. Um, uh, so these are at uh, system uh, level. They're for um, um, IT primarily, but their portion of it is also for facilities. I think the ratio is no more than 25% uh, for facilities. But again, for the same reasons that I said earlier, uh, we want to bring the classrooms up together. Uh, but the idea is to, as the catchy phrase uh, uh, implies, we want to be uh, updating our, our classroom so that we're, you know, we're contemporary at least, or potentially thinking of, um, about the future. The University of Maine's uh, allotment of the classrooms for the future money was $1.4 million. Um, we spent 200000 of it this last summer, and you saw the products of some of that. A uh, big chunk of it went into the, to the smart classroom, uh, and we made some of the other technology upgrades that we did. Uh, we've spent. So there's 1.2 uh, million dollars uh, available. There is a timeline for uh, spending all this money. Basically we need to spend it uh, in summer 2017, summer 2018. Um, 
We want to show, demonstrate to the Board of Trustees a good return on investment for that money. Uh, we want, so so it's, it's important that we do this in a, in a timely fashion and we do it in ways that we are getting a good return on investment uh, that we can talk about. So given the realities, this is how we're, uh, our proposal, our working plan on how this will move forward. In order to, do the, to plan the work for 2017, the summer of 2017, we need to be on that, on that in terms of the planning right now. So um, what we've done, uh, uh, again, primarily working with uh, the associate deans, but also with the deans, we've asked them for their needs, desires in this area um, to get to Jeff uh, St. John by November 15, um, so that we have, uh, have that information that again will go through these processes that I've outlined here with information from other areas as well to develop a plan for 2017. Now, we also though then have 2018. And because we have a longer timeline, uh, I don't, I, I, I'm gonna say unapologetically, we don't have exactly the steps figured out of, of how we're gonna prioritize that work because what we want to do is have a process that has relatively more faculty involvement since we have more time uh, to engage in the planning process. So some of what we'll be doing, um, we'll be talking with Mike Scott and then the co-chairs of the uh, Faculty Senate's um, Environment Committee um, about this and problem solve on how we bring folks in. We're gonna be doing some prep work uh, in the interim. So I showed you in an earlier slide, er, in a, in a slide earlier that there are 111 classrooms uh, controlled by, um, uh, by the registrar. Those 111 classrooms have been surveyed. People have been in them, looked at what technologies they've had. We know where the weaknesses and problems are uh, in those areas. A parallel process has not been done for the 148 classrooms controlled by departments or colleges or, or units. We want to do that because we don't want to exclude those from consideration in the classrooms for the future uh, dollars. So starting very soon, right? Very soon, the survey, meaning people going into those rooms, you know, seeing what's there, seeing what's working, um, uh, gathering input about those 148 classrooms is starting now, roughly, 90 days, it's pushing them a bit to get that done, but we're asking for it uh, in about 90 days. Um, so with a little flex time, by spring semester, we ought to have a full survey of our classrooms, as well as updated information on you know, the renovations that have taken place. And we are looking then to, to partner with uh, faculty to work in the spring semester on you know, get further input into prioritizing so that by next fall, that goes to these, these larger committees and they get in, you know, uh, they swing into action so that we develop a plan to spend out the rest of the money uh, in the summer of uh, 2018, if I follow that. Did I get that right, Robert, any comments or issues? You did, the only, the only thing I would ask is, um, as far as classrooms of the future is concerned, this is phase one. So we went to the board asking for 17 million and we have four million. <laughs> so uh, there's a phase two that we're working to advocate again, go back out and see if we can get, if not all, of the we originally asked for, at least a good chunk of that. So we'll hopefully be coming back to you with even more money. Great, thank you. I forgot to the dollar. Yeah, so four million system-wide, of which we were seeing a 1.4, uh, and, and then looking forward to bringing in additional funds. Okay. Really, that's the basic information I want to go over. Uh, and really, the rest of the time is just to see you know, what your thoughts are, questions, concerns. I mean, you, you uh, see this, and you know, perhaps you're thinking, it doesn't seem like that's the way it works to me. <laughs> so we want to hear that, right? Uh, uh, what, 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 you know, what can we do differently? Are there ways, other ways of going on? First of all, well, I, I guess I just want to um, compliment folks who put 101 Neville together. Uh, we, we found out on Friday before classes started that there was still work in progress there. We were pretty nervous because we teach, we teach our big honors classes there. It was, uh, it was, you know, most of that technology was put together by the time classes started and the, the new um, 
the new large screen projector was working very well. We had good, good experiences with that. Probably like a few other little things to do there still. But, um, you know, we were we were we were happy with that. But this now we have this really very large engine that we can use in our courses. So that was I think that was a nice change. I'll, I'll use that as another. Just a, a jumping off point to say, I don't think that's, that's unusual that one, things were working up to the last minute, or two, that they got done. I, I, I said I learned a lot of things coming into this job, and again, not to pander to, the, to some of the audience here, but we have an outstanding group of people in the facilities area. They are, really are committed uh, you know, to, to, to get this uh, work done, to have us have the best uh, university that we can. And it's been not unusual at all to hear people putting in extra time and, you know, overnights, et cetera, to get work done in a timely fashion. How about you? Uh, you mentioned uh, wanting to demonstrate good return on investment yeah. as far as classroom renovations, and I was wondering what that looks like for your particular audience. Okay, uh, so I'll, I'm going to jabber on a little bit about that, and I'll invite uh, these guys too as well. So, from my point of view, at the, at the very Basic level, it's usage, right? So are we putting the money in? How many students are, are going through in that? Uh, at a little more uh, complex level, you know, it's uh, satisfaction, right? Are, are the students having a positive experience in there? Again, how we look at that, it's a little tough, right? You can't, there's so many, you know, so many variables in that. But we want to be uh, uh, mindful of that in, in a qualitative way. The thing that would really, I mean, really, um, be a great ROI, and again, it's always hard to, to, to draw causal connections, but, uh, but when it behooves the university to do so, I'm willing to stretch. If we can talk anything about enrollment changes and at least show correlation with improvements in, in teaching technology, that's, that will have the biggest impact, from my point of view, on the conversations with the, uh, uh, with the uh, Board of Trustees. And again, I know it's hard to demonstrate, but if we can, we can make at least a straight-faced argument that there's at least a correlation in time between what we've done to upgrade our facilities and upgrade our teaching facilities and student growth. Um, they, they, that will, they'll listen to that. Robin? I, I, I have a couple of things. Yeah, we, the, the ROI that, that we are interested in are not really a financial ROI. There's a couple of metrics that the Board of Trustees and all the way up are holding us campuses responsible for is the net asset value of our buildings, which is a percentage of how good our buildings are, which is a low number, and the building renovation age, which is how long it's been since a building or a space will apply to a space uh, has been renovated. And uh, a very large percentage of our buildings on this campus and space, it's a part of that, have a, have a, a large a high renovation age and a low net asset value. And so one of the things we think about when we're trying to apply money, and especially if we have to go to the Board of Trustees for approval, is what, what, what is that metric, those two metrics for the space that we're working on. It's not very hard to, on this campus to find spaces that, that those metrics get improved on. Um, so uh, let me ask you a question about the fault we have to like a renovation like this classroom, mm -hmm. is it, would that improve the net asset value of Little Hall? It does. Okay. It, doesn't, does it? it doesn't improve because the net asset value is a ratio of the, of the cost of the building yep. minus the deferred maintenance uh, issues in yeah. the building. So as we as we diminish those deferred maintenance issues, which this room had a you know air handling unit that was forty something years old, past its yeah. useful life, so on and so forth, that does increase the net asset value very incrementally when you have five million square feet. But the building renovation age, though, it does not get impacted by the, this renovation. Yeah. yeah, because it's it's a metric that is, you know, does, has more than 50% of your building been renewed over a three year period. Yeah. Yeah. But we do have sort of a tendency to apply it to the space here, mm -hmm. and we know that these individual spaces haven't been touched, and so we're going to use that metric to help us define our projects. Well, I was wondering if there was an opportunity to think about ROI in terms of the assessment work and whether there's a connection to learning outcomes that might be a little more proximate than 
enrollment? So Brian, can you handle, can we do that? <laughs> can you help me? <laughs> We have a little bit of work to do before we're in place that we're going to be able to attribute learning outcomes to particular classroom venues. Um, uh, initially, uh, what we're really focused on here now is, is, is in program assessment, looking at broad base and outcomes. Uh, drilling down to that level would be a pretty big um, sea change uh, for us. I'll help Brian a little bit. Jen Time is here and she teaches in a room like the Shibles one that you're doing and she actually teaches some courses, the same course online and in rooms more like this. And so thinking about doing research about the effectiveness of the different designs because the costs and the capacities are different you know, in the different spaces. So we are trying to sort of get some, some basic research data about the, the learning outcomes from the, the different types of spaces. Um, thank you, Jeff. So, like Peter said, I teach in uh, this semester. I'm lucky enough to teach both at the Women's Hospital in Chicago and at Stuart. Uh, both amazing spaces. I'm um, really lucky to have them. Uh, so, it doesn't make me completely content because I'd like another one that's bigger. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the math department teaches large classes, and us and just about every STEM department on campus is working toward more active learning in our classrooms. And uh, we can't restructure our courses um, unless we have bigger spaces. Um, so one with 150 would be ideal. And um, along the same lines, not all lecture halls are equal because I can teach in Bennett 137 and myself and my MLAs that I hire, I can get around to every student. Um, they work in Paris and uh, I can easily walk around. And if, if that class is stuck in uh, Neville uh, 100 or 101, I can't do that. So it changes the complete structure of the class. And I don't think there's a little toggle in the info side on this asks how much active learning we do in the classroom or how needed I am to get around to everyone. Yeah. Um, so there needs to be some priority in lecture halls that when people are using active learning or MLAs or getting around to all the groups that they can they can take the levels of the world. And we can have the O'Bear and the, the um, Bennett and this one to some degree though it does take a little bit of the excuse me, excuse me. So, you know, keep that in mind. Yeah. Uh, even as we get stuck teaching in lecture halls, we need to have the right lecture halls. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think, as a report, then, did you want to, since you want to make eye contact with Jeff, I guess you don't want to address that factor. Can you say that? Yeah, yeah I, I would say, Jen, we've gotten an awful lot of feedback, as you know, about Info Silent, about trying to identify not just size needs or scale needs, but also how people are teaching in classes. We're accounting for more of that every semester. I won't pretend it doesn't remain a work in progress because it does, but we are thinking about that. And you may know from your own contact with student records, they have done a massive amount of work to try to make the schedule more sophisticated in just the way that you're describing. And one of the, one of the I was talking with the Dean's group yesterday about this a little bit in depth. One of the deans said, you know, a faculty member said, look, I've gone through all this training to be able to use this smart classroom. I'm, I'm, I, um, so I should have it. <laughs> I should, otherwise, it's wasted training. And I get that. But of course, our goal is to expand the number of people who have the training, right? to push pressure on ourselves to, to create more of these. Um, and I don't want to do things that say, and I know you're not suggesting this, but here's the pool of people who, you know, who teach in the smart classrooms and if you're not in that pool, you know, you're asking. Awesome. I think Mike, you Do you have a way of the committees have the benefit of any student input on setting priorities for platform improvement? Yeah, we not currently. We we rely on both faculty and associate deans, uh, primarily Mike, to give us input about what's working for students in the classrooms. I'm just thinking it might it might enhance your presentations to the board. Some way to show that the students are involved in the process. Uh, I mean, I was thinking like, I don't know, maybe when they do their professor evaluations at the end of the course, it is the, is the classroom in which the course is being taught yeah. appropriate to the needs of the students and the professors? So yeah. Why they come up with it? That's an interesting idea. How yeah, does the classroom facilitate or you know, some kind of question like that? Um, yeah, that's, a good, that's an interesting idea. Yeah. Because 
you know, we can think about whether or not to bring students into one of these communities. But the reality is, you know, you're asking a student to represent, you know, 8,500 undergraduates. Uh, it, you know, we do have committees with students on them, and, it, and it's it's good, but it's a tough it's a tough challenge for that. I'm just thinking, she's talking about moving around in a, yeah. in a fairly large room. Given her teaching style, she needs space to get around the desks. Somebody else may just stand up in front, and I, that may be appropriate, but it'd be interesting to see if the students think that the room is appropriate for the yeah. professor. Yeah. No, it's a good, it's a good, it's a good question. Peter? Certainly, the, the faculty can also get dinged if the technology or something in the room doesn't work, and the students don't always have a way of expressing that other than in the course evaluation. Yeah. So, supporting your idea of, of potentially some questions that help get at sort of the, the environment in which the faculty yeah. is, is teaching. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Let's look at it. Fred. Uh, sort of my perception is the paint college program can add a slow or take the last 10 years. They get some momentum and then there's some activity and then later on there's some momentum. I wonder if this represents an opportunity to sort of create sort of a stable database where since you're doing all these broad-based surveys and then you're asking for input, once this current list is developed, can that sort of list persist over time and be updated? Because what we tend to do is go back out and start all over again each time with that you know, inquiry out to the, the units and say, okay, what's on your list? And so, in some ways, you got a whole new set of chairs and directors who are coming into it separately, which is a good thing, but yeah. at the same time, having a, the advantage of seeing what had been on the list and why the justifications have been there can be helpful. And this becomes more of a stable process. Yeah. yeah. So that, that is an interesting idea. So we'll make the survey <coughs> This other uh, living document is only on you know, So this is where we're at in 2016. These pieces have changed. These have that, that's a, that's a great idea. And then when you when you request more input, it just builds on the original list rather than starting over. Right. Yeah. I just wanted to echo Francois's compliment about the, the work of, of facilities in IT. I mean, I, uh, I've been privileged to be doing a lot of work with Stuart and his team these, these last months. Uh, and I think there's probably things that we could all learn in our own departments and programs about how they're managing things from a systems point of view. And I, for one, would, would value um, you know, opening up the box a little bit and understanding how the systems work as smoothly as they seem to from the outside. So thank you for what you're doing. And if you can if you can share pieces of it with the rest of us, I think that could be productive. Yeah. Thanks, Are there questions or should we end on that high note? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll add yeah. on the high note. Hey, <laughs> um, I came at the tail end of this year's being college, so I wasn't really involved in the years. I was helping manage the last of the pieces. I have to tell you, echoing on what you're saying too, is I'm just amazed at how collaborative the work between IT and facilities, and um, especially when I'm talking to the stewards team, because there are so many times we IT reach out, we need to get in here there, we need to, we need to, we need to hurry this up here, and they did, you know, they did, they were, um, you know, IT did this problem, but facilities really came to the rescue. We create a lot of those situations ourselves too. So we'll <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, oh first, I, actually, I sort of have a question. It's a little bit tangential, but I think it concerns IT. And one of the one of the functions IT has had, or some 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 entity on campus that, that does IT, has been to do these software packages that are that are shared among departments or among students and so on. I'm just wondering. How that is evolving under the new IT uh, systems, because that, that affects teaching a lot as well. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a good question. And that, just for the past week or so, I've received questions too about how can we better support um, or push other packages out there that many faculty and staff and students use. So that's something we're looking into, and how, given the changes we've gone through, how we can support that. So would you say? Uh, I mean, I, 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 more specifically, 
so Francois or any dean would have maybe an associate dean bring those into an associate dean's meeting. I think, you know, is that the other Would you suggest? Yeah, I think that, that's a good way to right, do so it. We've also been working when those kind of questions come in. Anything that intersects with like Robin or Peter, try to talk to both Robin and Peter and get a sense of who should this flow to and yeah. what's the potential return for the college and who needs to be communicated with. So we tried to, to, to really constantly push out information and get answers back to people who need very interesting questions. Thank you. I have a follow-up question. I asked this one because it may be of interest to other people in the room. Peter and I have talked a little bit about this. Uh, is there any more progress in, in considering the use of virtual labs? So, uh, or virtual desktops, essentially, for students, and do you have customized software packages so that, that for example, you know, often in effects with a course where students have to go to a lab to run a particular software package, and that's problematic for online classes. Um, is that, is that, has that continued to be part of the discussion? Because I could see that impacting a lot of different things. I'm certainly familiar with it. Peter, have you heard any requests for? Yeah, and in fact, mm -hmm. the, the life science building uh, committee is, is sort of thinking of that as an essential feature for the, the new if a new facility comes about. But that's, that's thinking longer term. Something, uh, it's also known as a virtual computer lab, <coughs> and you can basically build an image and, and folks can sort of check out an image for a period of time um, so that you don't have to have the physical space to do that. Um, it's, it's very popular in these other institutions. Um, software companies tend not to like it, um, yeah. but that's a negotiation. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me uh, tell you in terms of coming attractions. Um, so the Hopi, hey, uh, another academic affairs faculty forum in November. I apologize, you, you have known the, the date in November, which we'll announce uh, with plenty of time ahead. Uh, and I'm trying my best uh, to tell, uh, talk with the campus about this primary partnership between University of Maine and University of Maine Matthias, uh, which is you know, taking shape as we speak. Um, I'm hoping uh, by November uh, is the right time to, to Kind of give more concrete information, but not so late that there's not still opportunity for action. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'm, uh, I'm kind of looking forward to doing that because I'm looking forward to trying to get my own head around it. And uh, it, is, it is a work in progress. But that'll be in, uh, in November. Okay. All right, thanks a lot. I appreciate you coming.